Good morning. I'm Rob Stewart. If you don't know me by now, and yes, this talk is different than the other one I did on threading, in case you weren't positive of that. In this case, I'm going to actually use these pieces a little bit more, show you how they play together, uh, common use cases and that sort of thing. We'll be talking about mutexes, lock guards, condition variables. If you're in my other talk yet, yeah, it'll be slightly review, but mostly this is just showing actual code using them. We'll develop a thread safe queue. It won't be the ultimate one, just an example. Talk about barriers and then uh, another way of using some of this stuff, uh, periodically invoking a task, having it on some sort of regular schedule, talking about some issues in doing that. So mutex is we have the options of locking one in a blocking way, non-blocking, even time-limited blocking. And they come in a unique and recursive form, where unique means that only one thread can own the lock at a time. Recursive means the same thread can acquire the lock repeatedly and then just has to unlock it the same number of times. So here's how it looks using std mutex. Create an instance, it's only got a default constructor. Lock it. We try lock. So lock is a blocking operation. We then try lock. That one fails. It's going to return false because that thread, that mutex is already locked. Uh, we'll then unlock it so that the next unlock on line four there will succeed. Then we have to unlock it again. This manual unlocking kind of stuff is a pain. We'll, we'll get in a moment to the lock guards that allow doing that with our AII. But an important note is if you destroy a mutex without having unlocked it first, you get undefined behavior. So probably a good idea to unlock it every time. Recursive mutex just keeps track of the count so you can do it over and over again, but otherwise it looks just like std mutex. Here's time mutex. This one adds a little bit to what mutex can do. Again, default constructor called trilock4. This is a uh, common pattern in the standard. Things suffixed with for versus things suffixed with until. Those with for use a duration. In this case, a thousand milliseconds. Those with until uh, use a, a time point, a specific time. So we're saying here, attempt to acquire the lock up to 1,000 milliseconds. And if you can't do it within that time, return false. And then here we're computing a, a specific point in time. So from now, add one second. And we're going to attempt it for that long up until that time. You can use different clocks. I use steady clock here. There's the high frequency clock. You got system clock. You can make your own clock type. There's a uh, concept for clocks, and you can develop one yourself if you like. So according to that clock, once time reaches the specified one, if it had not yet been able to acquire it, it will return false. Recursive time mutex, all the same sorts of things. So I mentioned the RAII stuff. We have lock guards for that. And the simplest one is stood lock guard, takes the lockable type. So that might be std mutex, it might be um, recursive mutex, whatever you've got. The uh, constructor blocks trying to lock the mutex. And then the destructor, when you go out of scope, is going to release it. Here we're showing try lock on the mutex fails because it's already locked. As an idiomatic uh, thing, I use underscore for variables that I don't need to touch again, that are just, you know, kind of, I need some name for the silly thing, but I don't want to do anything with it, so I just use an underscore and then I can ignore it. It doesn't clash with any other names I might want to use. Does that unlock it when, it's, when it comes out of scope? So yes, the destructor unlocks at the end of the scope. Now, there's another version of lock guard, another constructor. Repeat the questions. Yes, I saw that just, uh, but yeah, so the destructor of lock guard takes care of it when it goes out of scope. Um, the other constructor you pass in this, this extra argument stood adopt lock. What that means is you already own the lock, or at least you're telling lock guard you already own the lock. If, you're not, if you don't actually own it, well, too bad for you, because the destructor is still going to unlock it. But the difference then is that this constructor does not grab the lock for you. So if you're in a context where, for one reason or another, you already own the lock, but you want to make sure for thread safety or exception safety, you want to make sure that it is released at the end of a scope, you can still use lock guard for that. Does that all make sense? Okay. Then the other, one, uh, other use case here is 
introduce a block to control the scope because we all know you want to keep your critical section as short as possible. You want to own the lock for as short a time as necessary to, to control what needs to be synchronized, but you don't want to own it for any longer than necessary so other threads can make progress. So introduce a scope so that the lock guard is destroyed at the right time. So you can do work at line two while you own the lock, at line three when you don't own the lock, and other threads get a chance to proceed. Yes? Can the mutex be inside or outside those braces? It doesn't matter. Can the mutex be inside or outside the braces was the question. And yes, it could have been inside. I was making as few changes from the previous slide as possible in this case. And there may be cases where you've got the mutex in a wider scope and you're just using it in this narrow scope. Unique lock is the other REII class, but this one goes beyond just that functionality that we've got in LockGuard. Unique lock is a timed lock. That means that it offers lock, unlock, try lock, try lock for, try lock until, and some other member functions as well, besides having the lock and the constructor, unlock and the destructor kind of behavior. So this is pretty much what we were doing with LockGuard, construct the unique lock from the mutex. Here we see a new function that unique lock offers and lock guard does not, owns lock. And since we, the, this constructor acquired the lock, then owns lock will be true. Here I'm releasing it. This is a, uh, another capability of unique lock. The idea is, okay, dissociate yourself from the mutex I gave you in the constructor. I want to take ownership of it. It returns a pointer to the mutex that was given to the constructor so you can always recover the mutex without necessarily having access to the original mutex uh, variable. And so after releasing it, obviously we don't own the lock. And since I released it from the mutex in line three, then here in line five I need to unlock it again to make sure that I don't destroy it with the owning the lock. This is another constructor for unique lock, std adopt lock. This is just like we saw for lock guard. The constructor assumes that it's locked, in which case owns lock will return true. You can also do it deferred, pass in std defer lock. And what you're telling unique lock is, I want you to take control of this mutex forming, or generally any lockable that goes in there. Take control of it, but don't take the lock just now. The destructor will still unlock it later, but we're not locking it first. So owns lock returns false. Now we can actually lock it through the unique lock instead of through the mutex itself. So you can easily see how the mutex could be in some other uh, scope. You don't need to know about it once you've got the unique lock. And now, of course, owns lock returns true. Then there's try to lock. This one, the constructor, uh, simply calls try lock on the lockable. If it succeeds, great, then it owns the lock. If it fails, then it doesn't, but it doesn't fail construction. So in this particular example, there's no contention on it. We're going to get the lock. That's why owns lock returns true. And then uh, the, the rest of the example is pretty much like you saw before. We'll, we can unlock it and then try lock will succeed. So this constructor with uh, stood try to lock as the argument is just like calling try lock after using defer lock in the constructor. Then you can also control how long it tries. So try lock will return immediately. Either it finds that it can grab the lock or it can't. You can also control how long it waits, passing a duration to the constructor. So you don't need to add std try to lock as an argument. The fact that you're providing a duration is sufficient to tell it that we're doing a try lock for that duration. And so again, that's like constructing it with um, deferred and then calling try lock for yourself. And then we have the until version of it. Pass in a time point and the constructor will wait, will try up until that specific time on the clock to acquire the lock. Obviously, if it succeeds early, then it finishes early. It doesn't have to wait the whole time. Yes? So when it tries, how many, tri how many tries, uh, how many times does it try? Is it every time, every clock cycle it'll try or? The question is how many times does it try to acquire the lock? Does it do it something on clock cycles or something? And no, this is, um, this is an implementation detail of how it figures out when the timeout occurs versus when it is able to acquire the lock. 
um, you know, it's not specified what it's doing. It's not doing, going to do a busy uh, wait I'm, in most cases, I imagine, but I don't know the details at that level. Okay, yes? Um, okay, yeah, so, sorry, um, is, is the only thing that locks provide on top of mutexes is the RAII? I mean, that's what it seems, I'm sorry. So the question is, is the only thing that the, the lock guard and unique lock offer over the mutex is, is RAII? Basically, yes, except unique lock, of course, gives you the ability to lock and unlock it, and so, in other words, unique lock is itself a lockable just as a mutex is a lockable. Lock guard itself exists simply for scoped locking. So do you happen to know the motivation for why the standard didn't just kind of implement RAII for mutexes? Why did the standard not just make mutexes RAII classes? Uh, because you can move them, you can uh, reference them from multiple contexts, and so they, yes? Oh, uh, just that. Um, you know, it, they're more flexible when you get to control when it actually unlocks. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to ask about scope lock, actually. Um, <coughs> excuse me, how, that would, how that's uh, different from unique lock. I, I've only used scope lock and it looks very similar, maybe with fewer features. But, well, how would you distinguish them? Uh, is boost scope lock? Is that what you're referring to? Is it not in the standard? No, there's no scope lock in the standard. <laughs> so it's boost, right? I guess you, you, so he's asking what, how boost uh, scope lock compares to these things, and as far as I know, that's basically just lock guard. But I don't remember the specifically. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, so we'll look at condition variables. So condition variables are for synchronizing state changes between two different threads. You've got a changer whose job it is to say, hey, this state needs to ch is now this, I'm going to change it to this new value. Other threads, one thread, multiple threads, are going to be waiting around to learn when that state changes to examine it. So the changer's job is to grab a mutex, because we're trying to synchronize multiple threads, change the state, and then notify one waiter or multiple waiters, your choice. And then the state watcher is going to grab the same mutex, wait on a condition variable, which releases the mutex while it's waiting so that the changer actually gets a chance to change the state. And then if notified, then it's going to wake up from the wait and check the state and decide what it's supposed to do. But there's also this notion of spurious wake-ups where the wait function can return early. Pardon me. And so you, in examining the state, you determine whether or not you've got to go back and wait again. We'll look at how you control that coming up. Here I've got a condition variable, CV, a mutex that I called lock, and here's my state, just a bool. It can be anything you want. It can be complicated type, whatever, enumeration, and you specify that you know it's some default, and then you set it to various different uh, enumerators depending on what you want the thread to do in reaction. But we'll just use a Boolean in this case. So we're going to create a unique lock on that mutex, and then set the state to true. So it was statically initialized to false up here. I'm setting it to true. Then I'm going to notify one waiter on that condition variable. In the watcher, this would be running in another thread now. The watcher's job is to grab the mutex, check the state, and then wait on that mutex, on that unique lock. So what it's doing in that wait is atomically releasing the lock it had on the mutex, on the unique lock, then waiting for one, the notify one or notify all member function on that condition variable to be invoked. So it goes to sleep, it's quiet, it's not spinning, it's, you know, it's efficient. But it can wake up spuriously. This is uh, due to implementation details, efficiency in implementation and so on, that it can wake up without notify one or notify all having been called. If that happens, we break out, come back up, we re-examine the state, we find out it's still at false, so we come back and wait again. Now people have asked, well, gee, why, I'm sorry? Uh, and uh, is there a reason, uh, do you always have to have the, the, lock, the mutex locked when you call notify? Do you have to have the mutex locked when you call notify? No. And in fact, I'll show example code where it's not. 
Um, where was I? Uh, the spurious weight. Uh, so some people have asked, why couldn't you make weight detect the spurious wake-ups and not actually return until it succeeded? Well, to do that, you could imagine basically having a Boolean that said, I was, you know, notify was actually called, spurious wake up from the implementation, you say, gee, notify wasn't called, let me go back and wait again, and continue in a, a little while loop hidden inside of the wait function, and then finally you break out and then you're examining the state anyway to find out what you're supposed to do, and so in this case, we'd be checking two different bools for effectively the same situation. And so it's, it's just more efficient to leave that to you so that you can examine the state and decide whether you need to wait again. But you're, not sorry. you're not acquiring a block at this point. This is just, you're just going to wake up and go. When wait returns, you're right, I didn't mention that. When wait returns, it owns the lock again. So there is potentially... The possibility that it could be more efficient if the implementation were without having to reacquire the mutex could examine a flag or something, but this is what we have, that it reacquires the mutex, re-examine the state, if it hasn't changed, go back to sleep, you know, wait again. So yeah, wait releases the mutex while it's waiting, and then when it returns, you own the mutex again. Okay. Uh, here I showed writing a while loop where you examine the state explicitly in a while loop, but there is a, a variation where you can provide a predicate, and all it's doing is while the predicate's not satisfied, wait. So you can do it in one line with a lambda, or you can um, do it with the while loop like I had back here. Your choice. Okay, if there are no questions about how mutexes, the lock guards, and condition variables function, then we can go on and start playing with them. So we'll build a uh, thread safe queue here. It's a large design space for these things though. You've got multiple producer, single producer, multiple consumer, single consumer, uh, the, whether the queue is dynamic in size or fixed in size, how you're actually storing the elements, what sort of container or, or data structure you're gonna use underneath to store those elements, and even what you do when it's full. Do you block the producer until there's room to put the new item into the queue? Or do you throw out the oldest entry? Do you throw out the newest one? Do you just silently not push anything on when it's full? You can make all kinds of decisions about how it works, and there's no ideal because it depends on how you're using the queue, what your threads need to do, what kind of data you're putting on, what matters to your context. So. We're just going to make one, and I don't claim it to be ideal, or the most efficient. And if you wanted a lock-free queue, then you need to talk to Tony. This isn't a lock-free queue. So we'll allow for multiple producers, multiple consumers. Uh, we use a boost circular buffer for the storage. It'll be fixed size. And we'll actually have a design here that allows the producers and consumers to decide whether or not they block. And an important characteristic here is the last one that producers need to signal waiting uh, consumers that data has arrived. So if a consumer is waiting for something and the queue is empty, when a producer puts something on there, we need to tell the consumer, hey, you can go get it now. So here's the class interface constructor with the size, so how many elements we want to store on that queue. We'll have a pop and a try pop, a push and a try push, or we could expand this just slightly and we could say, hey, you know what? How about if we tell the producer, sorry for how low this is, uh, how about if we tell the producer uh, whether or not there was room when they pushed it? We'll give them the choice. If they call this push, then it will eject the previous, uh, wh whichever the, the oldest or newest, whatever design choice you might want to make, will eject an element to make room for the new one being pushed on there. And we'll return this uh, in a numerator here that indicates there was room and so nothing was lost, or it was full, which tells you you lost something. And then we could, with this other overload here, give the option of returning the one that was being ejected. So you could get back the 
the one that you decided had to go away because the new one was being added. That might give you the chance to log that, hey, you know, this thing got thrown out of the queue. I can't process it anymore. Maybe you, you go back and re-examine it and decide whether to put it back on the queue. You know, might be uh, an important decision to make in your uh, controlling logic. Okay, so to implement these, we're going to have a condition variable CV, a mutex called lock, and then our circular buffer I'm calling Q. Constructor, pretty simple. We just need to initialize the size of the circular buffer. Pop is where it starts to get a little interesting. So this is the one that's going to block if there's no data. We're going to create our unique, um, and let me just back up to make sure you've noticed this is the guard type, type def that I'm using. It's just a unique lock on the mutex type. We're going to create our unique lock. While the queue is empty, we're going to wait on the condition variable. This is that predicated wait that we need to handle spurious wakeups. So as long as the queue is empty, nothing for me to get, I'm going to wait on that condition variable. Once I've got data, then I can pull it off the front of the circular buffer, write it through this output parameter, and then pop the front off the queue. Now, I imagine most of you have read that uh, stuff about um, exception safe stack from Tom Cargill about how pop shouldn't return by value because you can get an exception in the copying, and so then it's not exception safe. That's why we're returning through an output parameter here. Okay, pop. Um, this one, oh, I'm sorry, this uh, variation is just a uh, predicated weight using a lambda. So I had to capture this in order to be able to reference the data member Q. And remember that the behavior, or if I said it, the behavior of that predicate that you apply, uh, supply to uh, weight is while the predicate is not satisfied, wait. So before we were saying while the queue is empty, so we need to negate that here because it's negated in the internal while loop. Otherwise, this is all the same. So now we get to try pop. This is the one that either immediately succeeds or immediately fails. It doesn't need to block for anything. So we're going to grab our lock, check to see whether it's empty. If it's not empty, then we're succeeding. We found something to return, so we're going to return true. And that's what I've got down here. So if we're going to return true because we found something, then we're just going to take it off the, the front of the queue. Now here's push. This one is going to um, push stuff onto the queue and uh, eject the oldest element in this particular case. Grab our lock. Here I'm asking whether the queue is full. And accordingly, that'll tell me whether I'm going to return was full or had room, so that the caller knows what result occurred from pushing this on. We just push it back. Circular buffer will eject in this particular case. It'll be ejecting the oldest element. I'm releasing the lock guard, the unique lock here, and then calling notify one on the condition variable. Backing up for a moment, remember that we are waiting on the condition variable here when it's empty in pop. So I'm notifying that waiter that there's now data. If nobody's waiting, this is effectively a, an expensive no-op. Now I've released the lock before calling notify1. Didn't have to. But the difference is, if I call notify1 while owning the mutex, then it's possible that the other thread, the one that's waiting on the, the condition variable, could get scheduled at that moment between the time I've called notify1 and the unique lock goes out of scope, could get scheduled, could examine, uh, discover that it was notified, wake up, attempt to acquire the mutex, find that it was blocked, and now that thread has to wait until this thread is rescheduled and the unique lock can be released, and then it can make progress again. So by releasing it first, it's tiny little optimization. Not a big deal either way, really. Um, Here's the other push. This one is going to return the, uh, the oldest value that gets pushed out if that happens. And so the difference really is just if it was full, then I'm going to write through that output parameter, and otherwise the rest of it is like we had for the other push. So the caller has to examine the return value to determine if it was full, then it knows that 
this reference uh, argument here was updated, and if it returned had room, then it wasn't. So we've just given the callers the choice of whether to block, whether or not, uh, not block, and whether or not they care about the previous value. Yes? Sorry, late question about the pops. You don't need to go back there, but you have them uh, taking the, the reference you know, to return the variable from mm -hmm. the reference. Uh, based on Chandler's talk the other day, he recommends returning by value. And I was trying to think if there was any really good reason not to rewrite those, to just return by value and let the move operations do their thing. So the question was, Going back to pop, and I, I will show that just to um, make it clear. Why am I taking a non-const reference instead of returning by value? And he was referencing Chandler's previous talk on uh, uh, the efficiency of return by value. The problem is that type T in its copy constructor or move constructor, depending on what would have been invoked, could throw an exception. And if that throws an exception, then you didn't actually get the value popped off the stack at that point. I, you know, I understood that, but it's one level above, and I was thinking for some reason because it's at the higher level, it wouldn't apply, but I guess it still does. Yeah, so it's, it's really because we've already taken it, taken it off the front when we call pop front that we can't return the value safely. We, you know, we can't maintain exception I safety in that case. That for some reason, because it was a higher level of abstraction, I, was, I thought that, that wouldn't apply. Sorry. Sure, no problem. Okay, uh, try push. This one's pretty easy. If the queue was not full when we called, then, um, then we're going to, re uh, so if it's not full, we had room to put it in, and so we're going to return true. And if it was full, then we're going to return false. You can pick whichever what logic makes sense to you, but yes. Um, do we have to unlock the guard before doing the notify one? Do we have to unlock the guard before doing notify one? No, you can choose which way you want. That's where I was discussing the, the possibility of a slight uh, performance benefit that the other thread doesn't learn of being notified before it is actually able to acquire the mutex. But it, it doesn't matter other than the possibility of uh, performance. It doesn't matter which order you do that in. So you could have just allowed the unique lock here, the guard variable to have uh, released it at the end of scope. Okay, so up to this point, everything that I wrote, you could substitute boost for STD. Boost mutex, boost condition variable, all the pieces, everything works the same. Now we're gonna look at a few places where they differ and what the ramifications of that are. So the first one is barriers. If you don't know what a barrier is, it's an object to which you, you give a number, a count, and you're saying, wait until that many threads have reached the barrier. So we've got these threads that are all executing, different, making different progress. Eventually, they all block on this barrier. Once you've got the required number, five in this case, then they can begin to make progress. So it's simply a way of coordinating among some number of threads. So, why would you use it? Preventing races between threads where you have some sort of dependency among them, where they need to share some information, whatever. So, you could wait till parallel tasks have finished their processing and now you're ready to collect their data. Or you could wait for some initialization to occur before they actually proceed, maybe because they're referencing some transient state and you've set it up so that once they've reached the barrier, then they're no longer going to reference that transient state. They've made copies of whatever they needed and so on. An interesting case is uh, something I use in unit tests. I'll spawn off a bunch of different threads, but I'll have them wait on a barrier so that all of the threads are ready to hammer whatever it is I'm trying to make sure works fairly well against uh, concurrent access. That way you don't get some of them running, you know, that one's finished before this one even starts and I really didn't test the concurrency. Boost barrier, pretty simple constructor with the number of threads you want to wait on, and then a wait function. It's not copyable, not uh, movable. Can't get much simpler than that. So how do you use it? So in my example here, I'm going to create 30 threads. So I'm going to create a barrier that waits on 31 threads. Why? Because I want the creator of all those other threads to also block on the barrier. And I've got a function work here. Don't care what it does. And I'm going to create 30 
of these stood thread objects operating on work and I'm going to immediately detach. That way they're running free and I don't have to worry about uh, stood threads destructor which we'll cover in a bit if you don't detach or join causes you some problems. So all I've done is launched 30 different threads that are running work. Now I can use the barrier. I can do some initialization work, wait on the barrier, do some more work, wait on the barrier, keep going, wait on the barrier, however many times you want to do it, you can reuse it. I've now collapsed the previous for loop into one line, just creating all those threads, and now I've got two different weights. So here's what happens. After creating all those threads, they go off and do their initialization work, and then each one of them waits on the barrier. At that point, you, can have, you would have 30 different threads all waiting on the barrier. Main comes along, this primary thread here, comes along and it also waits on the barrier. That makes your 31st. At that point, all the threads are free to make progress. So now all those other threads in the background go off and do their remaining work. Eventually, they finish and they wait on the barrier again and main has also waited on that barrier again. So now main knows they've all finished. At that point when 31 of them are, are waiting on the barrier, they all get to make progress. Main of course exits. Remember we detached from all those threads so they're still running except based on how we set this up after the second wait on the barrier then work exits, those threads will go away and we're safe. Obviously, toy example, but uh, hopefully you can imagine how that could be useful in your own code. So, I contend barriers are quite useful, but guess what? You don't have them in C++11. So, uh, and you might be tempted to go use boost barrier along with your um, standard library code. You know, you've got std threads and std mutexes and so on, but that's not such a good idea because barrier is implemented, as we'll see, in terms of mutex condition variable and so you're going to pick up a bunch of pieces out of the boost threads library and use those in addition to those you're getting from your standard library which is kind of a waste. Not that it's any, not that it's a correct program issue, correctness issue or efficiency issue or anything, just you know bloat and dependencies. So we need one for C++11 so how about if we try making one. So back to the signature, pretty easy, we need to construct it takes the number of threads that we want to wait on and a wait function. So, what are the requirements? We need to uh, probably make sure you don't pass in zero, maybe even not even uh, allowing one, because what's the point of having one thread block on a barrier? So you could do something, but at least we'll do non-zero thread count. Uh, wait until enough threads are blocking, or uh, have block until enough threads are waiting. Switch those words around. Release all the waiting threads once enough of them are waiting. And then once we've released them, reset things so that a new set of threads can wait. We saw in the example before, we waited on the barrier two different times in each thread. So non-zero thread count, pretty simple. Constructor is just going to test for that, throw an exception. Here's where you can say, you know what, better be at least two, whatever you might want to do in your design. Next one, block threads until enough are waiting. So that means we need to know how many threads are waiting currently. We need to know how many are supposed to be waiting. And then we need to uh, make them uh, block, make them wait around until enough of them have arrived. And then finally release when enough have arrived. So if there are too few, we need to wait for more. Means we need some sort of account of how many are waiting and how many we're supposed to find. So each call to wait will increment the number of waiters and we'll compare that against the expected. If we have not yet reached the expected number, we're going to wait on our condition variable. Yes, I know I'm not dealing with spurious wake-ups. We'll get to that. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so far I've said I need a condition variable. I need a count of how many threads are supposed to be waiting. I need a mutex and I need to know how many are currently waiting. So we'll add those data members. And so revisiting wait. We now need to deal with when there are enough waiting, we want to release them all. So that should hopefully suggest to you condition variable notify all. And so the notion is if 
the thread that just called wait is the final one, then we want to notify all the ones that are waiting. And this one gets to just exit from wait and make progress. Otherwise, it's not the last one, and so it needs to wait. Once we've released those waiting threads, once we got to enough and we released them, then we need to set it up so that more can wait. So at the very least, we need to re reset our ca uh, waiters counter so that the next one that comes in will increment from zero. But we need a condition to deal with those spurious wake-ups. So let's add a... Uh, you might immediately think that you could wait on a condition like uh, waiters is not equal to expected. But the problem is that before we call notify all, we're resetting the number of waiters so we can reuse things. So we can't use that as our condition. So let's go with a Boolean. The first one in will set the Boolean to false. The last one will reset it to true. And then our condition down here will be uh, based on, the predicate will be based on whether or not proceed is true or false. As long as it is false, as long as we haven't gotten to this point, we need to continue to wait on the condition variable. Once we've gotten here and it's been set to true, we want to break out of the wait loop. But there's a problem here. Can anybody see the problem? You won't break out until the next time? You won't break out until the next time? Your schedule? Well, sure. You, you won't, until your thread's scheduled, you don't even get a chance to find out you've been notified. If, if that's what you were referring to. Yes? Uh, would it be possible that you would want to make your waiters like an atomic? Uh, Might we need to make waiters atomic? Well, we own the lock this whole time. So we've already controlled atomicity of that. You can call wait again before all of them are woken up. Can you call wait again before they've all awakened? There's the problem. So what happens when some of the threads wait a second time before those that were supposed to have been released by the notify all even got scheduled to recognize that? So we need to make sure that only the group that had been waiting and was supposed to respond to notify all wake up, and any others that come along wait. So we need a concept of generation of waiters. So this is what we had. This is what we changed to. We'll add this generation data member, and we'll take a copy of it so that we know what generation we're in when we enter wait. Then when you reach the right count, when we've hit the right number, we're going to increment generation so that any subsequent call to wait will find a new value of generation. And the reason for all that is so that now, and I've gone away from the Lambda version to make this clearer, the predicate that we're using for the weight on the condition variable will be as long as generation equals the data member, as long as the one we captured here is the same as here, we need to keep waiting. If we got through this point and this got incremented, then this condition will fail so that once we're awakened at that point, we find out, oh, gee, it's some new generation of waiters that have come along. My generation has been notified as finished. I get to exit. Make sense? Now, the code you've got here, it's my style and fit on the slides and so on, but this is basically what you'll find in Boost Barrier. So we'll just update the class definition. We need to add our extra generation variable, and now you've got a barrier class. Yes? Could you go back to the previous slide? There's no incrementation of wages anymore? Waiters is not incremented anymore. Uh, whoops, yep, typo. Plus plus waiters. See, I said it was mostly like what was in Boost Barrier. 
Yep, typo on that slide. Okay, uh, and obviously we've got a few more data members, so just for completeness, had to update the constructor to initialize things. Okay, periodic invocation. The notion here would be you want to call, invoke some sort of a callable, and you want to do it with a fixed interval in between, so mm -hmm. the callable runs, then there's a fixed interval, you run it again, fixed interval, run it again, or maybe you want it to start at a regular interval. So now you need, however long it takes, you need to compute the difference to figure out how long to wait before you invoke it again. You can just imagine this being, you know, some sort of a timer sort of an operation. One of the issues to deal with is whether you want one thread per callable or you want to use a pool of threads so you control the number. The Fixed interval notion of just always having a, a fixed gap between them is pretty simple. We'll have a little infinite loop here, invoke our task, an argument to this invoke function I've got here, and we'll go to sleep for the specified interval. So now you can see that you can ask a, the current thread, which is what this thread refers to, to go to sleep for a certain interval. There's also sleep until, which allows you to specify a particular clock time rather than just a duration. So, pretty trivial here, just infinite loop, run the task, wait a bit, run the task, wait a bit. Now, let's do that in a separate thread, make that useful. So in main, we'll create a thread, give it invoke as the thread procedure, and then arguments for invoke are task and 500 milliseconds. So, what we're saying is, run this function named task here, then sleep for 500 milliseconds, run it again. Finally, I'm calling thread join because uh, stud threads destructor will do nasty things to your program if you don't join or detach from the thread. That is to say, it calls to terminate. So you want to make sure that you call join or detach for every one of the stud threads you create. So what happens if that task that we gave to invoke emits an exception? Hmm. Not good because std thread calls std terminate. Seems to like doing that, you notice? Just as from main, you don't allow exceptions to escape, right? You typically will write a handler that catches everything and says, I got some unknown exception. You might handle std exceptions and report that separately and a few other types perhaps, but ultimately you catch them all and you just, you know, I don't know what happened, but we got an exception here, right? Well, in a similar vein, you need to do something with your thread procedures. You can't let exceptions escape from them. So, we need to handler for that, so we'll just catch them all and whatever makes sense in your particular case, you're going to handle exceptions. So you might, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the idea, but you can, um, from in this handler, catch all handler, you can rethrow the exception. And if you do that inside of another try block, and then you have all sorts of handlers there, you can then decode what it is. So if you take that notion and package it into a function, then from right here, you can call that function. That function in a try block can just do throw semicolon and then have myriad exception handlers to decode all the exception types you expect in your program and turn it into a string or do whatever else makes sense for you in that particular case. So you can now capture that logic one place and reuse it any place you need to catch all and do something with all the exceptions. So, another problem. Yes? So when you you were talking about basically re-throwing, right? Yes. So that means basically you're going to lose your stack trace, right? From your unwind when you throw it again into your second handler? So the question is, if I re-throw the exception here, do you lose the stack trace? And no, you don't. Okay, okay uh, so going back to the simpler version, uh, we've got an infinite loop here and it's not interruptible. That brings us to a difference in boost threads. Boost threads are interruptible. There is an interrupt member function that you can call on a boost thread object that will set a state on it such that at various interruption points, which are predefined by the library, it will emit a boost thread uh, interrupted exception. So those interruption points are one in particular, you can call the boost thread interruption point member function, which is the idea there is you get to a certain point in your code and you decide, here's a good place where I'm willing to be interrupted. So you call interruption point, and if somebody had previously called interrupt, 
then interruption point will throw the exception. But there are others that are defined like waiting on a condition variable and uh, sleeping and so on. And you can go read in the Boost documentation to see what all those uh, interruption points are. But the point is, when you do a bunch of these various operations, you could get this exception. So you need to handle it one way or another. And so um, you could choose to write a handler, log it, do some cleanup, whatever makes sense in your case, and then just return. Or you can just allow it to propagate because Boost Thread understands that one particular exception and it'll just silently absorb it. Guess what? We don't have interruption in C++11. And it's a really cool feature. So we could invent our own monitor some sort of a synchronized flag, use a mutex or an atomic bool or something like that to control it so that your thread at periodic points is going to examine that state, find out, gee, did somebody want to interrupt me? Okay, I'll quit then. Or we could maybe package it up in a class, make it a little easier to use. So let's try that one. We'll create a class called thread interrupter, default constructor, give it an interrupt member function, which is to say, mark it as desiring interruption. Interrupted would say somebody called interrupt if it returns true. And check for interruption would throw an exception in that, in that case so that if somebody did call interrupt, it'll throw an exception. And we'll implement it with an atomic bool. So implementation of these things is pretty simple. We just need to initialize an interrupted flag uh, to false. If you call interrupt, we'll set it to true. If you call interrupted, we'll just return that value. And then where it gets interesting is check interrupted, or check for interruption. And here I've defined a, an empty exception type that uh, check for interruption will throw if interrupted was set. Okay, pretty simple. Here's how we could employ it in our um, invoke member function. We just need to pass an interrupter as an extra argument now. And then at various points in our processing, we simply call check for interruption. That would get us the exception. We've got a handler out here that silently absorbs it and just allows us to exit. Now, obviously, you don't get the nice feature that Boost Threads offers of having all those extra interruption points. This is the equivalent of Boost Thread interruption point. You have to consciously invoke it at the right times. And worse, you have to pass along one of these thread interrupter objects. Okay, here's how you might invoke all that. So we're back to main here trying to use invoke to run task in another thread. So we create our thread interrupter and we add this extra argument to the uh, call to invoke. And notice that I'm using std cref so that I'm passing in a reference, a const reference to that interrupter. Uh, arguments that are passed to the std thread constructor that are to be passed along to the callable get copied or moved into internal storage in this thread object. So if you want it to be a reference, then you need to use std ref or std cref. So we then, uh, since that thread is off and running, and um, I then go to sleep for five seconds, whatever, I'm just, you know, needed to do something so to let it run. Then we call interrupt on the interrupter. Eventually then, invoke is going to reach a point where it can call check for interruption and detect that. And then finally we call thread join. Make sense? Okay. Now we can do this at, yes. Are there any reasons to prefer standard thread over boost thread? Uh, if you don't want a dependency on boost, if you're using libraries that already have dependencies on std thread and you don't want to add the boost threads dependency to your program, um, because you like the standard library better than boost. I, you know. <laughs> as far as they know, there aren't any performance benefits or anything like that. I'm unaware of any performance issue, uh, differences between them, but that doesn't mean there aren't. And obviously that would depend on the particular implementation of your standard library. Yes? I suppose it's conceivable you could come across a platform that's got a C++ 11 standard library but doesn't have boost support. It's possible. He, he suggested there's always the possibility of a platform that has a uh, C++ 11 uh, 
uh, platform but does not support boost. Like an embedded platform. Yeah, some sort of embedded platform, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. It's just a bit unfortunate that they don't have the interru interruption feature. For I agree. Interruption, I think, would be great. Uh, so that means somebody just needs to write the proposal and try to convince the standards committee that we need that. Okay. Uh, now we can also do this at the regular interval. This is the one where we want it to start at a uh, regular interval regardless of how long it might take. So we'll, we need to compute the balance of the interval after the task runs. So we're going to use system clock now to capture the start time. We'll run the task. We'll capture the stop time. Then we'll compute the uh, elapsed time between them. And as long as the elapsed time is um, less than the interval, that is to say it took less time to run the task than we needed, then we need to go uh, to sleep for that uh, leftover time. Minor variation on the other, other theme. So one of the problems you run into with doing something like this is uh, the potential for oversubscription. Depending on the uh, concurrency of your platform and the number of these tasks that you wanted to run in the background at, at this regular sort of interval, you could end up with too many threads. Each thread requires resources from the system. They're, they need something like eight megabytes, was it? Something ridiculous uh, for stack space on uh, Windows. It, it's, it's a significant uh, expense, less on Linux, but still, even there, still expensive to create a thread. So you got stack space, you got kernel structures, you got the, just the overhead of scheduling that many more threads. So it's, it's not a free lunch to just go create as many threads as you want. And there is an upper limit on every platform. So you don't want to just scale this up. And what's more, depending on the concurrency of your system, you can only run so many at a time. Now, granted, some of them will go to sleep or otherwise be quiescent and you know, sitting there blocking on IO or whatever else it might be. So you can have other threads running. So having more threads than you have cores is not necessarily bad. But if you wanted to get all mathematical and so on, try to represent it like something like this, you know, you're saying if the time it takes to run all of your tasks consumes all the available time the CPU's got, then you've got no idle time left. That means you're, you're at least saturated. If you end up with negative idle time, in other words, you've, it takes more time to run them than you've got um, CPU power available to do it, then you're oversubscribed and you need to do something about that. So what you could do is allocate or uh, set a maximum number of threads, put the tasks you want run into some sort of chronological queue, sort them by time when they're supposed to run, then have the threads dequeue a task, invoke the function, compute the next time they're due and put them back onto that chronological queue. So now you've controlled the number of threads and you're just running through the set of threads according to the, the chronological order of them. This is a variation of thread pooling. The idea of using a limited number of threads to do more than that amount of work. So we might do something like create a scheduled task structure that holds our callable the interval at which it's supposed to be uh, executed, and when next it's supposed to run. And then put that into some imaginary chronological queue, which I'm not going to present. And the idea, obviously, here is that it's going to sort based on the time to run the task. So going back to our thread function, we still have our infinite loop here. And the idea is we're going to create one of those scheduled tasks objects pop one from this queue, and uh, presuming that's going to wait until, it, um, has, until it's time to actually run one, invoke the task, check for interruption, calculate when next it's supposed to run, and then put it back onto the queue. So we're, the, the hope here is that this imaginary chronological queue actually blocks until the right time arrives. That should suggest things like waiting on a condition variable or something. But what, another important thing is that popping from that queue, I just said, is going to block. And pushing a task onto that queue could block, depending on the design. You may not have room, right, if it's a fixed size especially. So those are blocking operations, so you can't interrupt them. 
Once again, it sure would be nice if we had interruption built into the standard library so that waiting on the condition variable, whatever else, was an interruption point. But we don't have that, so we need to do something. So we could try sort of a busy wait here. Try to pop the task off the queue. Yield the, this thread's time slice. And then check for interruption before we go back around and try again to get one. Now, you could decide, you know what, I'd rather have it sleep for a little bit or you know, do whatever else makes sense in your particular case. But this is the, the basic idea. You could also take all of that and package it. And we're going to do the same thing with push down here, but exact same idea. You could take all that and consider maybe your chronological queue actually has the ability to take a, uh, an interrupter and does all that work for you. You know, it's an imaginary chronological queue. We can decide what it has. So, gone over mutexes, lock guards, condition variables, thread safe queue barriers, periodic uh, callable invocation, just all trying to show how to use mutexes, condition variables, and so on. Now, I will entertain questions, um, but I have bonus slides because I wasn't sure how long all this was going to take, so I can go on a little bit longer. Uh, but any questions before I go on? Yes. So the question was, the uh, queue that I designed, how would you modify it to use move-only types? Um, the pop functions were designed to take a non-const reference. Um, as long as it's a movable type, when we do that assignment, it would be a move assignment into that reference. So you would just simply have to do std move uh, from the front of the queue, and you'd have to have the, the from the front of the circular buffer, you'd have to make sure the circular buffer or whatever other structure you were using was aware of, of uh, move semantics and so on. Make, so you could move out of the data structure into that um, reference argument and then uh, pop it. So you are saying you just need to modify the body and a few STD So it's question, would it just work if you just modify the body of the, the function to use std move and so on? And I believe that would be all it would take. As long as your container, uh, the type, you know, was move semantics re really requires the type still destructible. So when you do the uh, uh, pop front from circular buffer, for example, it should work. But I don't think circular buffer has any move support. So you really are talking about a different data structure underneath. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, the, the basic idea would work. Yes? Um, so you said the motivation for passing by reference into the pop function, or returning the reference, um, was so that was because the copy constructor can throw. Is that correct? Yes, the reason that pop takes a uh, non-const reference rather than returning by value is because the copy or move constructor, if you were to return by value, could possibly throw. Um, but couldn't the assignment operator also throw? Couldn't the assignment operator also throw? Yes, indeed it could. But I'd have to go back awfully far to get to the slides, but um, pop does not pop from the uh, circular buffer okay. until that assignment completes. Um, okay. There's great data loss. Thank you. Yes? Uh, I just want to add a comment also. Uh, when you do the assignment, it's still under a lock. So you, I, I don't believe you could actually return it directly by value because uh, you still need to be under the lock. Yeah, his point was that there's, there's an additional complication if you were to try to return by value because at the point where you wanted to return the value, you're still, you own the lock. What you would have to do is move it or copy it into a local variable so that you could finish the rest of the work and then copy it out. And even if the first copy or move succeeded, the one on the way out of the function might still fail. And so you're still in the same situation. Yes? standard says that the return value is constructed before the destructors of any variables in the function scope are called. They have to be because it could be copied from a local variable. So the lock would be released after you've done the copying wherever the return value is going to go. So it's safe. 
The, the point he's making is that the return value is constructed before any uh, local variable destructors are invoked, but the problem is that the return value that was constructed is not the caller's value, so there's still a copy to come to get it out of the function to the caller, and that could throw. And by that time, you would have already uh, modified the data structure. So computing the return value does not mean that the caller now has the value. That means that the value that you're going to return from the function has been computed prior to those destructors running, but you still then have to get that return value back to the caller. They're the same thing. No, they're not the same. Because there, there's a copy at that point that can be done. RVO certainly would mean that you would eliminate that extra copy, but that's not necessarily going to occur. Okay, so there's still contention that that's safe, so perhaps I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that, that it would still be an issue. So we'll, you know, we'll have to check that out. Okay, um, and I'll mention these resources before I go past this slide. Um, there are a variety of resources online. That's the link to the uh, Boost Threads documentation. Um, Anthony Williams has the uh, studthreadco.uk uh, site where he documents a lot of this stuff. Um, you can also find at cppreference.com, for example, a lot of things. And the C++ Concurrency in Action book is a nice book, gives you a good introduction to a lot of the topics, um, talks you through using a lot of these things, and the latter half is a reference to all the different classes. All right, so the um, stood thread destructor uh, has the semantics that if, you, if the thread is still joinable, which is to say you've neither called join nor detach, then it calls to terminate. The idea then is you need to choose, before you just let that std thread object go out of scope, you need to choose whether you're going to let that thread run unattended, called detach, or you want to wait for it to finish, called join. The reason for that is because um, that thread could still have references to data and so they don't want to just have it detach implicitly. You want to control uh, when that thread goes away so that if it's referencing other data, you don't want that stuff to go out of scope while the thread's still referencing it. And if it joined implicitly in the destructor, that's sort of hidden away, you know, just you know, stack unwinding in other cases, there are situations where it would just automatically join and that could be kind of surprising because you don't see that in the code. So the, the choice instead was, we won't do either, you have to make sure it happens. So, um, the, it, detach only when the thread is independent. So if you don't have um, a state that that other thread is referencing and you're happy to let it run to completion, you're sure it'll run, you don't need control over it before you exit main and so on, then just detach and be done with it. In a lot of cases, though, you need to join before you're finished with that thread. You want to make sure that it's completed before you move on. And so REAI is really handy for that. So we've got two different ways of doing this. We can hold a, a reference to the thread, and then in the destructor, check to see if it's joinable, and join it if so. Or we could uh, move the thread into a, an REAI object so that it has ownership and we've lost then all control over the thread and uh, allow that thread, uh, that, that REI object to um, join it in the destructor. But the difference there would be that since it's taken ownership of the thread, then that thread had better be joinable because that's the purpose of such a class. So thread guard is the first of these. This is um, actually from C++ um, concurrency in action. Uh, taking a reference, saving as a reference, and then the destructor is simply going to say if the thread is joinable, then call join on it. So this is just making sure that no matter how you exit the scope, you call join on your thread. The difference between doing this in std threads destructor and doing it here is because you choose to create this thread guard object and decide that I want to make sure I join before I'm finished. The reason for the check, of course, is because you could have detached or you could have joined it yourself after making other decisions so that this object at the end will simply uh, call join if it's still necessary. 
Pretty simple, but can be useful. The other option is scope thread. And this one, as the name might imply, means that within that current scope, you own that thread and it doesn't escape. We're going to move the thread object into this scope thread object, so we own it by value down here. The destructor, of course, is where we want to um, join. And then because this is a scoped thread and not just some sort of a guard, then I've added get ID and native handle. This is also based on, on what Anthony has in his book, but I added the get ID and native handle because it made sense. This represents a thread. These are the operations that remain once you take away joinable and detach. You want to, um, and join for that matter, all you've got left is get ID and native handle, but you still might want that. So the idea here is you can create a scope thread object and use all the things that remain that are sensible as if it were a stood thread object. So the constructor is going to move the argument into the data member. And then we're going to complain if that thread is not actually joinable. In other words, you only do this when it's joinable because we've now made the destructor not check to see whether it's joinable because the whole point is we're taking the thread object from the caller. We now own it, so the whole point is that it's supposed to be joinable. That's why an exception in the constructor. These are just forwarding functions. So yes? What happens if you join a non-joinable thread? Um, does nothing or...? The question is what happens if you call join on a non-joinable thread? Um, I'm pretty sure you get an exception. I don't believe it's undefined behavior. I think it's an exception, but I can't remember positively. Comment was boost join throws an exception, which probably suggests that the same is in uh, stood thread, but I, I can't remember. Yes. Okay, somebody looked it up and the answer is yes, it throws an exception. All right, well, that's all I had. Yes? Sorry if this has already been answered, but what's the difference between join and detach? What's the difference between join and detach? Detach means that the stood thread object gives up ownership over that uh, executing thread. So think of it in, in terms of POSIX, for example. The stood thread has a P thread T data member that refers to the running thread. As long as it has that correct P thread T in it, it's able to exercise control over that running thread. When you call detach, it um, resets that P thread T's or sets a boolean somewhere to say I don't own it, whatever, so that it no longer has control over the running thread. So that thread will run, continue executing whatever code it's got as long as necessary. You may have an interrupter or some other means elsewhere by which to tell it to stop, or it may run infinitely, but you no longer have any control over it. Can't even get its ID anymore. With, uh, with join, rather, you are saying, uh, block until that thread has finished execution. Once that thread procedure exits, then std thread gets control back and join would return. Okay. So can you attach a new thread process to a detached thread? So detach the thread from it and then attach a new function to, to start running on that thread object? So the question is, can you detach and then run a new uh, uh, thread and a new uh, function uh, on that same std thread object? Yes. Not on the std thread object itself, because the only way to give it the uh, callable that it's supposed to run on a thread is in a constructor. Okay. Yes? Do you know if the standard join allows you to capture the thread's exit value? Does join allow you to capture the thread's exit value? No. Because in p threads it does, so that's one of the reasons you use join instead of detach if you want to capture the thread's results. Can't do that from a detached thread because it's yeah, so in order to get a return value from your uh, uh, running process, you're really going to want to use package task and get a future. So in my examples, I was using a std function and not a package task because I didn't care about the return value. I wasn't going to wait on it because it was going to be happening uh, recurringly. 
And so there would be no way to communicate. Well, you could. You could put futures into a container somewhere for another thread to come along and wait on to find out each time the task was uh, executed. But that was um, not necessary in the example. Yes? Uh, what happens if you have a detached thread and you uh, leave a If you have a detached thread and what? You leave the main function. What happens if you have a detached thread and you exit main? Your program keeps running. But exiting main means certain amount of cleanup is occurring. And so your thread may not keep running as well as you expected. <laughs> uh, C out, C air, and so on, those streams are actually uh, still valid in that situation. But a lot of other cleanup will have occurred, and including your own state, which may wreak havoc. Basically, it's not a good idea. Something else I could mention that you might find useful is um, I, I mentioned the, the number of times when std terminate, uh, it'd be worth having a slide for it, I didn't do it. Um, std terminate gets called. If you let an exception propagate out of your thread function, if you uh, destroy a std thread object without calling join or detach. Um, it used to be that writing exception handlers in main to capture any exceptions that uh, you didn't handle anywhere else was all that was necessary. But now that you've got threads and these other thread procedures could emit an exception that you forgot to handle, std terminate gets called. That isn't necessarily a good thing and it makes it hard to debug. Um, if your process is running in the background and does not have a console, then you'll never know why your process just disappeared. And we had that situation where we had a process that um, was a, a daemon on Linux and we weren't handling a particular exception and it blew out of the uh, thread procedure and the process just disappeared. Nothing logged, no, you know, we just had nothing. There was nothing in the uh, far log messages or anything to give us a clue. It just went away. And it was only when we ran it in the foreground after pondering over all sorts of things, trying to figure out what was going on. We ran it in the foreground, and the runtime was kind enough to say that std terminate was called because of a certain exception. Oh, gee, there we go. Um, so you really want to handle it. So what you might really want to do in your programs from now on is install a terminate handler. Call set terminate, and you provide the function that std terminate will call when these conditions occur. And what you can do in there is rethrow the pending exception, decode it, log it, you know, throw your hands up, whatever you want to do. Give yourself a clue that the program is going away. But there is one particular uh, thing you need to deal with, and that is that um, if somebody were to try to rethrow the pending exception when there isn't a pending exception, guess what gets called? Stood terminate. So if you, in that situation, your terminate handler tries to rethrow the pending exception to figure out what went wrong, you'd call std terminate. Infinite loop. So you need to use a static variable to detect whether you already did that once and then say, oh, well, that must have been somebody throwing when there was no pending exception. Yes? Is your way to approach this under Windows because it's set terminate per thread, not, not global like in GCC? So his comment was that uh, the terminate handler is installed per thread under Windows. There's a process handler for editing, and it's a criteria or crash key problem. You can catch it, catch it somewhere else after. I know it will get to thread terminate, but it doesn't get to it like it's the standard way that GCC and Linux would be. Yeah, I mean, you have to use an API to, the, the, you'd have to go to the platform API. Okay. But you, right. could, you could handle it, I mean, we handle it that way. Because I know if you rethrow in Windows under set terminate, it will actually set patient fault and die right there. So the, the discussion is that there, there would be platform specific ways to install a handler that if your process dies under those circumstances, you could detect it. Um, in that situation also, you could just set the terminate handler in each thread. Right, so the very first thing you do in your thread procedure is set your standard terminate handler, and that way it's always calling the, the one you're expecting. I didn't know about that, that difference. It all, yeah, I know when you get there, if you, if you did have an exception, you do the rethrow in Windows, it will 
that's not in the stack is not the same. And it's different in release and debug, too. It's a whole different behavior for both. So re-throwing when there's no pending exception does all kinds of wonderful things under Windows, is what you're saying? Because I have this code. We do it. We do a Windows version and a, and a Unix POSIX version of it. Works great. I was going to ask you if this is pretty standard and known behavior. Because that works great to re-throw, but Windows will segmentation for it. And then you do have to set up separate set, set terminates. And then there's some custom APIs for each thread to do it. But you don't have the same stack. And I know in release and debug under Windows, um, the behavior of termination is different. So they have like, hooks in there for their IDE. And so it exits differently. So if you set it up for development, and you think you're good, and then release and runtime, it has a whole different behavior. Well, yeah, you can, the debugger will actually interrupt the, your, your yeah, handler well, so that you can debug, yeah. um, which is nice. But the exit path is actually different, so you have to set it up correctly for release and debugging. So he's saying, I'm not going to be able to repeat it all, but he's saying that, uh, under Windows, I uh, that uh, the, the exit path actually, when you rethrow with no pending exception on Windows, uh, differs between debug and release, for example, and, and when you're running under the debugger and not, and so on. So it, it complicates matters a good deal. Anything else? Thank you.